and follow presented by DraftKings. I'm Megan Reyes. Joining me are Logan Hackett and our favorite WNBA analyst, Roz golden -Witte. After 28 years, the New York Liberty won their first championship in franchise history. Let's start the show by taking a look at the moment they did it. <laughs> Tarleton lobs it in, taken away by Phoebus. Off to Stewart. 28 years in the making. The New York Liberty are WNBA champions. The original franchise. So the moment this happened, I was actually watching on my phone outside my hotel waiting for a DoorDash. So I got to experience it on my phone on YouTube TV. But Roz, you have been by the Liberty side all season long, and you're also Queens born and raised. So what was it like for you being there and watching them lift the trophy? You know, I, I immediately felt the enormity of the moment. And I think the context of, you know, growing up in New York City, my mother, not being an athlete herself, just being a, a woman who wanted her daughters to, to see female empowerment and opportunities through sports, you know, taking me to a WNBA game in New York and having that exposure and being a fan growing up, seeing how long it took, seeing the streamers coming down from the ceiling. Um, you know, I happened to be on the court. I was you know, in the tunnel waiting for the game to end and running out to the court, no matter who won, I was coming out there. And I happened to go straight into the direction of Teresa Weatherspoon, hugging and crying with Swin Cash. And she was also there with Angel Reese. And I was taking that video for our group and I'm watching Spoon and it really hits you. The history of this franchise, the, the drought of not winning, you know, for so long, being one of the original franchises in the history of the WNBA, um, and then finally breaking through here, I did feel the enormity of it, you know, what it meant not only for this Liberty team, but for the franchise, what it means for the WNBA. And during a time when everything is just so amplified by the excitement and attention on women's sports overall, it was it was huge. It was big. It was so so awesome. Hearing you about it makes me like a little emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's talk about the game. So in a game where Sabrina went only one and one for 19 with five points and Stewie had, went four for 15, I think the stat was the team overall were two for 23 from three. How did the Liberty pull the game off? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm watching the game and at one point down the stretch, I'm looking at a lineup and it's guardless. There's no guards on the court. And I'm speaking with, you know, fellow broadcasters and colleagues and friends. And I think the lineup was Stewie, uh, Leo, Niara. I mean, I can't, I'm like, I'm blanking right now, but it, the whole thing was all bigs and no guards. And I'm like, well, it makes sense. Nobody's hitting threes. I guess they were like, let's just go with size, you know? And then also to think about uh, the contributions that, you know, bench players were making, reserve players were making. This was a game where what shined for the Liberty was organizational success, was scouting success, was putting together, coming off of the loss against the Aces last season and coming putting together a strategy of what did that returning core group of starters need surrounding them to get them over the hump. And it was the heroics of Niara Sabali. It was the heroics of Leonie Fiebisch. And I thought huge minutes, Kayla Thornton and, 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 and other players who just like throughout the course of this heavyweight battle in the finals stepped up. So um, I think depth shined and look for, you know, you look at Sabrina Ionescu, she'll get flack for going one, 15 she still had like nine or eight assists and rebounds she had barely any turn one or two turnovers against the very physical and hard defense in, in the in the links you know your shot may not be going down but you still need to be solid up here and be a floor general for your team and same thing for Stewie came up with big free throws so it was a great gritty team win what do you think I think that's the thing about box scores they don't always tell the full storyline um but I actually, Logan, I want to get your thoughts on the other side of the ball. So Roz told us what went well for New York. I would love to know your reactions on what didn't go so great for Minnesota. Oh, I think especially coming down the stretch when they lost that lead. I mean, they had a pretty good lead. I remember watching at one point and I'm like, 
oh, I had a parlay going for an NFL game and I was looking <laughs> like, I can possibly go check on that. Um, so I think honestly, all that, sure, there's the controversy about the calls and everything, but at the end of the day, they were up, they were on the Liberty's home court. They kind of had it in their hands and it didn't really work out for them. Also, Alana Smith, if you're watching this, I hope you're okay. <laughs> but she was doing well, but when they come down to injuries, I mean, their depth was not as deep and performing as much as the Liberty's was. If you would have told me that, the Liberty would not have won that championship without Nyara Sabali. Like literally two weeks ago when, when we were having the conversation about, about death, I'd be like, uh, oh, well, I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but seeing her come on and seeing the confidence that Sandy had in her lineup to put on a lineup that she's never even practiced with before and rely on people like Nyara, who is technically her second um, year in the league. That's really saying something. And I don't think that the Minnesota really had, I don't think Minnesota really had that depth down the stretch. And I, I do want to follow up on our your great points about depth and earlier what I was saying about the big lineup. Um, I have my scribble notes from the game. Mm -hmm. So the lineup, I, there's actually, as during the game, I take a lot of notes. I'm old school. I handwrite things. And it's like, guardless lineup, of, <laughs> exclamation point. And it's it's literally John Quill Jones, Leonie Fabish, uh, Kayla Thornton, Niara Sabali, and Stewie was on the court. And we like, there were like things we never saw before, you know, but that's what it takes sometimes to win a championship, you know, and that's the luxury the Liberty have. The fact that coach Sandy Brandello trusted her depth enough to, to go to them. The season's on the line, baby. There's nothing more than this. And she trusted her depth. A lot of times, guys, when when it's playoffs, men's, women's basketball, NBA, WNBA, college ball, and the pressure is high, coaches shorten that leash. Coaches, oh my goodness, all of a sudden that seventh player off the bench don't even see the court. So it's actually really says a lot about Coach Sandy and her trust of this team, the development of, of the entire roster over the course of the season, that with for all the marbles, she was like, we're going to give you a shot and, and also that those players were ready. Well, I love this. I love your thoughts on, um, on this topic. And I want to continue on a thought that Logan, you actually started with was the controversial call. And as we know, Lynx head coach, Cheryl Reeve had her own theory of why the Liberty won. Um, let's take a look at what she had to say. Coach. I know all the headlines uh, will be Reeve cries foul. Uh, bring it on, right? Bring it on because it was stolen from us. Bring it on. Well, we talked about it, you know. Um, we know we could have done some things, right? But you shouldn't have to overcome to that extent. This ain't that hard. Officiating it, it's not that hard. I tell these guys, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't work out, right? It just doesn't feel right um, that you lose a series with that level of discrepancy, you know? Well, as we know, losing a championship and having a post-game press conference immediately after, the the emotions are high. And so I would love to know from both of you, I'll start with you, Logan. What are your thoughts on what Cheryl had to say? I completely understand it, especially in the moment. I mean, you pushed it to game five, you had the lead, and the way that it ended for it to go to overtime wasn't ideal. I mean, that would be the first thing that I would be mad at. The whole team would be mad at, honestly. So I get it in that sense but at the same time as i just said you had the whole five games you had the whole game there's a reason why it wasn't that you didn't win at the end of it so i uh, maybe she cooled off and was able to kind of see um the i guess reality of the situation in the end of it but i do understand where her emotions and probably the team's emotions came from in that moment before we go ahead and look at the actual call Roz, what are your thoughts on cheryl's comments yeah, I think it's understandable uh, immediately after the game and especially for such a hard fought battle and such an emotional one to react and um, feel that much emotion around it. Like full stop, I think either side. We've heard both coaches within this series complain publicly to the media about the refs and the foul calls. But what that also says to me is like, hey, it went in favor of one team or another throughout the series. There were certainly things that the Lynx got, you know, got a, a favor favorable whistle or bounce on um and i think there is a sportsmanship aspect of this that i do understand people you know pushing back at coach and especially after the game i'm kind of like all right everybody's got their emotions you know this is sports but 
to continue to carry on well after the game, whether it's through social media or in closeout interviews. I think now that's where it's, it's you've got to be able to be professional and, and give credit um, because it was a five game series. You know, if we even look at game five, the game went to overtime. There were many, there were a few players who perhaps came out hot for the links in the first half and in the second half were quiet or mm-hmm. struggled through the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like there are things that you could look at as the links and say, hey, we weren't that great. Or, you know, there were games where you gave up 26 points on 20 turnovers, or you could look at the Liberty who made mistakes all through the series. This is sports. You could look at the Liberty who, you know, star players and have a good shooting night in game five, but role players played out of their mind. X factors are what changes series. So, um, you know, I think for, for sports fans, it's what makes it interesting for the conspiracy theorists you know, they love that on Twitter. Um, and I think, you know, look, a W is a W is a W. A win is a win is a win. And it was fitting for this heavyweight battle where both teams were awesome, that the win was gritty and hard and scrappy and, you know, came down to like, possessions. Okay, well, let's take a look at the call that led to Cheryl Reeves saying the championship was stolen. All right, so how it goes, the Lynx believe this was not a foul, and a lot of people also pointed out that Stewie may have traveled. So was this a foul, or should the travel have been called? I don't know much about basketball rules. I mean, I know a clear foul when I see one, and I cannot see one there. But I will say that when I was watching it back, when people started calling out Stewie's travel, I was like, oh, whoa, that is very apparent. Um, but, Roz, what do you think? Because you played, you know the game so much better than me. Yeah, you know what's so crazy is, again, like where I was during this part of the game, like literally I'm getting ready to to get on the court regardless of, you know, who wins and we're going to cover the championship. So what I can see from under the tunnel is the jumbotron and like pieces of heads on the court. But I actually what I remember from the moment was like just that the foul happened And then that Stewie was on the free throw line again. And for me, what I was thinking, like as a, as a basketball player was just like, boy, I hope she, you know, I, I would, it would be awful if she missed the free throws again and like had to feel that, that horrible feeling, you know? So I was like, oh gosh, oh gosh. I was just like hopeful that Stewie would be able to step up, you know, and she did and knock them down. She was ready to redeem herself, you know? So, uh, That's kind of the viewpoint I had. And then I was covering the championship at that point, the celebrations, the locker rooms, the champagne. So by the time, and then I, as a New Yorker, (laughs) went out with my friends to celebrate as well. So it wasn't until the very next day that I actually like scrolled through Twitter and threads. And I was like, oh, it was drama. I was like, oh, LeBron tweeted? I was like, oh, Isaiah Thomas has smoked? Like, everybody was coming at conspiracy around this. And I, I was, it was like crazy to see how much drama there was. But it, I'll say this. I think the foul, I think there was a bump. But if you're looking at the hand, you might be like, oh, you know, it's a tough call. I hate, I hate any game where the refs are a part of, mm-hmm. you know, a huge historical moment but I will say in watching the replay for whatever reason that clip does look like there was foot motion in the play before but again you're talking about one play over the course of a five game series that went Mm -hmm. to overtime it's it's hard to make it just about that one moment because it's really not well coming up after the break we look ahead to the 2025 WNBA season we'll be right back Welcome back into Good Follow. Before we shift our focus to 2025, Roz caught up with WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert after Game 5. Let's see what she had to say about this season and the WNBA Finals. Well, it's going to be a historic season when we all get everything done and a season to remember. We're going to be looking back in 10 years saying this is the turning point for just not the WNBA women's sport. So amazing season, amazing WNBA Finals. Both teams deserve to win two overtimes in the Finals and Game 5. I 
love the excitement. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, is the commissioner right that the season will not only be the turning point for the W, but women's sports as a whole? Absolutely. If you thought the W had drama this season, you should definitely look at other leagues because there's so much drama and chaos, especially when it comes down to playoffs. I mean, the NWSL right now, we thought we knew it was going one direction and now it's like completely shifting And the past few years have been very dramatic. So I think it's a turning point for literally everything, not only because of the play, but also the players and how they're coming up and how they're being recognized more in like pop culture and social media. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it even says a lot having like what you said, Roz, when you're having players like LeBron and Isaiah Thomas and all these big athletes and celebrities and people chiming in on the drama and talking about it on Twitter and threads like it, like this isn't a moment. Women's sports are here. Yeah. And I, and I also think the WNBA this season was record breaking uh, rate rating shattering um had star power and compelling storylines that got attention that the league has never seen before and what what's important to me is that the product lived up to all of that hype the product was excellent the players the rookies led by caitlin clark led by angel reese they had historic rookie seasons you know the actual playoffs and products themselves were thrilling, captivating, compelling, all-star weekend. What a great all-star game the WNBA put on. You know, the counterparts at the MNBA, oh, they need to work on that. You know, like how uh, exciting was this finals that won all five games, nail biters, huge shots, celebrity sidelines, and then finally goes down to an overtime and was captivating. You know, superstars emerging, fresh blood in the Minnesota Lynx, Nafisa Collier, might be one is is one of the best players in the world now and you know it's thrilling and so i think this is just uh the beginning i think that you can double down on this and i think next season the wnba and media partners and people covering women's basketball will be much better prepared you know i think this season was awesome and a lot of us a lot of people were caught off guard mm -hmm. caught flat-footed had some faux pas had some miscues you know, uncomfortable moments. And I expect next season um, will be, you know, more hopefully smoother sailing as well. Well, to your point, Rods, in my opinion, men's sports could never write the storylines that women's sports just organically have. They just can't. Like, like you said, this series, the MNBA couldn't do it if they wanted to. <laughs> and you want to know why? I do. Because woman. Exactly. Like, that's all it really better? comes down to. It's inherent. <laughs> Who does it better? You know? and, and I mean, even like, you know, fashion and league fits and getting to know the personalities and who these people are and um, and who these players are. It's just fascinating, you know, the, not, not only because it's women, but because all of the players in the WNBA are so diverse. There's so many different kinds of expressions of femininity and body types and stories. And, and I think that's also a really competitive, compelling and unique part of the WNBA. You know, the fact that um, these are highly visible, highly competitive and highly diverse, a group of players. And then at the same time, they also feel very relatable. And I think that's what makes it like a yet another reason it's such an attractive product. And they date each other. So there's drama. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and there's <laughs> drama that way too. <laughs> well, let's move on to our next look ahead for 2025. The Liberty have three unrestricted free agents in Brianna Stewart, Courtney Vandersloot, and Kennedy Burke. Now that they finally have their championship, I got a way too early question for you. Can the Liberty repeat? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think they can. I, I feel like Stewie's not gonna go anywhere. Like I feel like she resigned with them watch her go somewhere and I eat my words. But even with the group that they have now, if Stewie leaves, they're going to get somebody just as big, I feel. So I think they could definitely repeat and everybody might be trying to chase what they have now. Yeah, I think I think this is a team that is built to run it back. This is what the, the staff, the players, you know, echoed immediately after winning. And I expect Stewie is going to be back with the Liberty. Um, 
you know, where there could be some whispers and changes might be around Courtney Vandersloot, who now um, has her second championship and has seen her role diminished with the Liberty a little bit. Perhaps next season might not want to do that and may look elsewhere. And actually, she's got a, you know, a big time co- contract that could open up a lot of space for another type of player to come into the Liberty. There's a chance the Liberty get even better. And, um, you know, and I think that improvement within returners, you know, could, who could fill a spot like that? There have been names like Jalen Sherrod who, you know, made impact in her minutes into the game. But I think this Liberty team has room for a lot of improvement. That's crazy. And I don't even think they're as good as they can be. So, I'm excited. I think next season could be big for them. Well, after losing in the finals last season, the Liberty were out on a revenge tour that, as we know, ended in a title. So with the Lynx feeling like they might have been slighted and that their championship was stolen, are they the team to fear next season? I feel like the Lynx, yes, because they're coming back with such a vengeance, especially if they're like, oh yeah, the finals were stolen from us and that's how they are still feeling. They're bringing that in wanting to run it back to the finals and win it their way rather than it being stolen. So yes, they are to be feared, but I think the ultimate team to fear is still the Liberty. Yeah. And I think it'll be a different mindset for the Lynx next season too. I think the Lynx are, are, I think it's, they're right there with the Liberty again, but the mindset is different in that one, they expect to be there next season. I think there was a journey to understanding what they could be this year. And next season, I think there's like this concept of like, all right, revenge tour, right? And I also think they'll also be hunted differently. I don't think they'll catch it. They won't catch anyone on by surprise. And um, that's a different mind, mindset too. You know, so for me, the top two teams next season will be the Liberty and the Lynx. And I also expect the Aces to be right back at the top next season too. I don't know if I'm skip, jumping the gun there. I was actually going to ask your thoughts on where Vegas falls in this. So uh, that's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I think like for me, the teams I'm looking at next year at the top are Liberty, Lynx, and Aces. And I think arrested, healthy Aces with a retooled supporting cast, it's going to be very good. Guys, they were really good this year and they weren't anywhere near what they needed to be. You know, they still played in the semifinal. So that's going to be key. And I think like for me, the team that could make the biggest jump into contender might be the Fever. Coming up, we continue our look ahead to the 2025 season with a new game called Reboot, Reload, or Rerun. We'll be right back. Welcome back into Good Follow. Now let's look ahead to 2025 with a new game called Reboot, Reload, Rerun. Uh, We love our games here. And in this game, I will tee up a team and our job is to determine what they should do next. Should they blow the whole thing up and reboot their team, make some big moves this offseason and reload, or do they stay the course and rerun with what they've got? And we don't have to all agree this time. So you two ready? Yep. Ready. (laughs) Okay. I think we're going to do this good this time. Our last two go arounds at games haven't been our strongest, but (laughs) this one is on our side. Uh, Let's start with the Las Vegas Aces, who finished second in the Western Conference. The Aces' quest for a three-peat came to an end this year in a Game 4 semifinals loss to the Liberty. They went 12-8 and in conference play and 27-13 overall with the help of MVP Asia Wilson. Should the Aces reboot, reload, or rerun? I'm in between reload and rerun. I think a, a small reload. In what way? If they couldn't repeat with the team that they have and the team that they got the first two with pretty much, then I think we need some changes. For me, I think it's like a mini reload on the supporting cast. I mean, we're rerunning the core four group, um, the Asia, Chelsea, Kelsey, and Jackie. But, you know, this is a group that needs more size, needs more rebounding, needs better defense, needs better health. uh, health. Um, And I think that with that kind of retooling of the supporting cast, they'll be right back there fighting for a championship. Again, just like they did this season, but they'll be a top team for it. Any other thoughts from you, Logan? I mean, Roz kind of touched on it, but depth was an issue for them this season. 
Yeah, that was going to be my first answer is they need to work on depth, especially because we've been seeing teams who like their bench players are really coming in clutch. And I feel like they rely on their core so much that the others are not really up there on the same level. So I'd like to see that happen. And if they once they get depth, I think they will definitely be running it back. And look, the, the Aces have been historically not deep for the past few seasons now, and they've been able to overcome that. But the rest of the league is getting better. Um, and the teams know what to do against them at this point. I think it's time to re-up and look at the success. I'll use an example. The New York Liberty had coming off of their loss last season in the WNBA finals to the Aces. What did GM Jonathan Cole do? retooled the roster to support that core group and that bench, that second unit, the Niara Sabalis, the Leone Fibishes were huge in helping the Liberty get over the hump and win a championship this season. If they can pull that off in the aces this off season and find the right pieces that make sense, they're right back there. I mean, you know, this is, a and as, as long as that core group gets the proper healing and rest, mm -hmm. Um, that they need because, you know, Chelsea was unhealthy. And I, I think there have been players on that team that went through a lot, not only on the court, but off the court. And, you know, this would be a really important off season to just Usa, gather yourself and come back ready to go. Well, let's move on to the Eastern Conference. We have the Indiana Fever. The Fever took third in conference play going 11 and 9 in 2020 overall and made the playoffs for the first time since 2016. Current Rookie of the Year, Caitlin Clark, led the team with 19.2 points per game and Aaliyah Boston leads in block. I'm sorry, and Aaliyah Boston led in blocks and rebounds. So should the Fever reboot, reload, or rerun? Roz, what do you think on this sun? I mean, I like that young core group rerunning that back. Um, they've got something really special in Aaliyah Boston and Caitlin Clark. And the two of them together looked really great. By the end of the season, they found their rhythm. And individually, they were excellent. Obviously, you run everything back with Caitlin Clark. She was excellent. Um, that second half of the season in particular was explosive, historic. Her entire season was, um, you know, We'll have to see what Kelsey Mitchell does, but that's a huge key in, in having her back. Um, I think for the team overall, though, they could use some reinforcements inside, helping with size, um, helping with rebounding, and helping defensively. So I guess exactly. the answer is they already, much like the Aces, I think they have a core that works. You reload, a mini reload in strategic positions, but I, I think they got a core that is going to be one of the best in the WNBA in these years to come. We're looking at the new, this is that next generation. I think they need a bit of a, li a little bit more of a bigger reload, just building around those players though. But as you said, like once they can get the whole team around them and then playing off of Caitlin and Aaliyah, potentially Kelsey, then yeah, they're definitely gonna have a shot, especially with Caitlin like driving that car. Well, like you said, Roz, for everyone, key free agent is Kelsey Mitchell. So we'll see what Indiana does there with them. But we're going with a, a mini to major reload. Um, but now let's look at a team in the middle of the pack this year, the Phoenix Mercury. 10 and 10 in conference play, 19 and 21 overall this year under... Um, under head coach Nate Tibbetts, finishing fourth in their division and a potential retirement of Diana Taurasi. Should the Mercury reboot, reload, or rerun? I'm going with reboot, to be honest. I think they tried to have too many stars, offensive stars, the people that are going to go get the points on their team this year. But the way that they're working together, it's just not working for the team. It wasn't really working on defense, and obviously it wasn't getting it done. As So as much as I like them all together, I think... They maybe tried to do a bit too much. I'm not too sure because when you look at other super teams, you still have big names, but they all play different roles. And I feel like a lot of these players were kind of playing similar roles. So yeah, reboot. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, well, we have to wait and hear from Diana Taurasi and the franchise is patiently waiting as well. I mean, her decision changes everything, you know, re regardless if she stays or goes. But if Diana Taurasi does retire, you are immediately in a reboot. <laughs> if you didn't know, if if Diana Taurasi says, I'm done, DT, I'm walking away from the game, whatever franchise she was on is rebooting because, you know, now you're talking about culturally stepping into a new era, um, into a new identity, into a chance to really think about, like, what does the Mercury look like moving forward? And it gives you the room to... To, to make a new roster, to try new things. You know, you have Coach Tibbetts, who's a brand new coach. Now he can really, you know, perhaps build out a vision alongside 
the GM and, and Nick Uren and really build out what they want to do for the franchise moving forward. You know, much like if you remember Kobe with the Lakers at the end, Diana Taurasi, very similar in the sense that they have earned the opportunity here to take their time on their decision. They put butts in seats. They are the franchise. They are the goats. They are greatest of all time type players. And at the end though, and I say this, the words I like softly here, in some ways it holds the, the franchise hostage on their way out in the sense of like, it's hard to move forward until you make room for what your future identity and vision is with them moving out. So this is a really key moment in franchise history for um, the Phoenix Mercury. And it really rests on what Diana Taurasi decides. Well, other than the potential of re retirement of Diana Taurasi, another key uh, free agent to look out for is Brittany Griner when we're looking at the, the Mercury. But let's move on to another team. We'll look at someone who finished middle of the range, and that's the Seattle Storm. They took third in Western in the Western Conference, going 13 and 7 and 25 and 15 overall, with Jewel Lloyd leading um, in points per game at 19.7. Um, let's also not forget the Storm had Skylar Diggins Smith, Ezzy Magbagor, and Neka Ugumake. Should the storm reboot, reload, or rerun? Oh my gosh. I think I'm going to go with reload on this one. Mm. Yeah, maybe like another mini reload to build around, like once again, that core that they had last year. I mean, their record, I, sorry, can you re say their record again? 25 and They 30? were 25 and 15 overall. 25 and 15. For some reason in my head, it doesn't seem like that. It seemed like they had a bit like worse of a season, um, especially because before him, we were talking about them kind of competing with the Liberty and the Aces up there. And that's not really what we saw from them. Um, so yeah, I think a reload would, they would really benefit from that. Yeah. And I, I think so too. I, I think uh, one, we have to see what Neka Agwumake, where she's going to end up. That's huge. And whether she's there, anywhere Neka is, that team is immediately better. She's, um, had an all WNBA season, one of her best seasons of her career, but I think it flew under the radar because of the um, kind of middle success that the Seattle Storm did. With Gabby Williams, every season, it's kind of hard to know, is she going to be available, you know, in the U.S. or not? Is she going to want to play um, or can she? Um, you know, I think Jewel Lloyd, there, some, some hard questions, you know, need to be, presented in that she hasn't had an efficient season this season for sure. And she's their franchise or she's, you know, one of the players they're looking to, to build around. She's got, she must have a better season next year. It, it can't carry on like this. Um, so there's pressure there. I think Skylar Diggins Smith will, will bust out next season. She really used that Olympic break and bust out in the second half of this season. And we saw like once she got her lungs and legs and conditioning under her, she was so much improved. So I think like next year, there'll be a lot of growth for this team. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some some movement. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And I wouldn't be mad at a at a, at a mini reboot, a mini reboot. All right, for our last team, you all know I'm a California girl, so let's look at the Los Angeles Sparks. The Sparks were last in the conference, going 8-32 and 32 overall, which was the worst season in franchise history. They also fired head coach Kurt Miller, and number two overall pick Cameron Brink was out most of the season with a torn ACL. Should the Sparks reboot, reload, or rerun? And for context, two of their key free agents are Kia Nurse and Ari McDonald. Reboot it. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Keep some players. Like keep Cam in there. She deserves to play as she was drafted because she didn't get to play much last year. Reboot. I want to see a completely different team, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, the core that you have to build around is really exciting. Like it, it, the, the supporting cast, you can, you can plug and plug them in. But again, this is one of those teams where like the future is bright. Cameron Brink, you know, hopefully she comes back in a, in a full, healthy, and also fast manner that, you know, allows her to be back for the season um, and hopefully no complications. And Rakia Jackson had an incredible rookie season. And so you've got this great core of talent, of, of youthful talent. Don't forget, you know, the, the Sparks might, might end up with the top draft pick because they were so poor. What if, what if Paige Beckers is in LA? Like all of a sudden you've got this really incredibly talented power packed star power packed crew in LA 
I mean, the potential is huge. And so um, I think this is really where your GM shines and putting the right veteran pieces around this group and, you know, an original, historic, legacy franchise in the Sparks has all the potential to be great. You know, so I, I'm excited. All right, we're voting full reboot, which is, I think if I might have been our first full reboot of the game, but I'm with both of you on all of your answers. Cosign, 100%. <laughs> Um, but that's it for our game of Reboot, Reload, or Rerun. Coming up, I reveal my DraftKings picks of the week, and Logan shares her latest good follow. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Follow. Before we get into our weekly picks, our partners at DraftKings have an offer that's perfect for any game day. Right now, new customers who bet $5 will instantly get $250 in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and sign up using promo code GOODFOLLOW. That's $250 in bonus bets to spend on parlays, live betting, or picking straight up winners after betting just $5. And if sports betting is not yet available in your state, you can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy and have the shot to win cash prizes. Again, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code GOODFOLLOW for $250 in bonus bets instantly after betting just $5 only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay, now it's time for this week's DraftKings Sportsbook picks. The NWSL regular season comes to a close, and the Houston Dash are set to take on Bay FC at home. Bay FC secured three crucial points with a 1-0 win against NC Courage, thanks to a late goal from Abby Dahlkemper, keeping Bay FC's playoff hopes alive. Bay currently sit in eighth place with 31 points, and a win or draw against Houston would secure their spot in the playoffs. With so much hope on the line for Bay FC in their inaugural season and Houston struggling season, I'm picking Bay FC to get the three points on the road. I'm also looking out for Asisa Oshala, who has seven goals this season after joining Bay FC from FC Barcelona. And on the other side of the ball, Vets Abby Dahlkemper and Caprice Didasco will have to frustrate Houston's offense. Logan, what are your keys for Bay FC to keep their play playoff hopes alive? Once I feel like I say this every week, but it is crucial that they score goals, like lots of goals, because as we know, the tiebreaker, as I think as we'll come up to, the tiebreaker is going to be with goals. So they really need to get that number up, but I honestly don't think they'll have that hard of a time doing it, given that they're playing Houston, who hasn't won in a fair amount of time and hasn't really had a great season. Well, and also like, I wish I actually wish I had prepared the stat prior to this, but there was a point in the season, well into the season where Bay FC hadn't drawn a game. They were either losing games or winning games. And to your point, like some of them were just like, we just needed more goals. And it's always such a scary moment when it comes to playoffs. I think unlike any other sport, when it comes down to like, you could be right there and it could come down to, you just didn't score enough goals or whatever the time breaker may be. Yeah, I was looking at their recent games on, I think, Monday, and it was either like 1-0 or like 2-0 mm -hmm. or they were losing 1-0. Like they were not getting numbers on the board. And especially with the teams at the top, they at least have a few games where it's like four goals or even three. Like it's not that bad. Um, but also when it comes down to that, they're going to have to be great on defense because mm -hmm. once again, they can't have any goals scored against them. And you don't want everything like canceling out and they just end up breaking even again. Well, let's look at the rest of the competition because if Racing Louisville win their last game against San Diego and Bay FC loses, they would end up tied on points because right now in the standings, Racing Louisville are right below them. So, um, and like you said, they would actually take the tiebreaker due to the um, 11 goal differential. So how do you think this is going to play out with, with Louisville? I have no clue. Honestly, in true NWSL fashion, like I, yeah. Louisville would lose and then Bay would lose or something <laughs> like that. But San Diego is a tricky team because they have some wins over some like decently good teams, especially the ones in the middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, Louisville has good wins and on paper, they should be beating them. Um, so what I think is going to happen is honestly, they might just both win. I could really see that happening, but this is also the end of your song. We have to be considerate of how much chaos there is. <laughs> I was going to say, that's what's so hard about NWSL predictions, especially in the playoffs, is it anything can happen. And that is one of the things I love most about soccer and women's soccer is like nothing is guaranteed. Anything can happen. 
And all the teams kind of that were fighting for a playoff spot were super close for a little mm -hmm. bit up until last week that just kind of came down to Bay and Racing Louisville. So I, I would not wouldn't have expected Bay to be here given the beginning of their season. But with that said, they're also kind of peaking at the right time to make it into that spot. Totally. And I was so wrong last week. I said Angel City was going to do it. <laughs> and then not only did they not get the win, but Bay's win um, actually just it eliminated them before they even played against Utah. Well, let's look at Kansas City. Two weeks ago, Temwa Chewinga scored her 19th goal, which broke Sam Kerr's single season scoring record. And then last weekend, she scored her 20th goal and became the first player to score against every opponent in a single season. Um, Temwa is seven goals ahead of Orlando's Barbara Banda in the Golden Boot race. So ultimately, she secured that title. Now, if she can do this all in her first year in the league, what can we expect from Temwa in year two? I don't even know because you say like we're saying that she's conquered the end of yourself because she scored against every team. What what comes what after else can you do? The end of, yeah. <laughs> but it's so crazy. And I absolutely love to see it again. Going back to that Ballon d'Or snub, like that is absolutely insane. But the mm -hmm. sky is truly the limit for her. Like maybe next year she aims to score multiple goals against each team. Like I truly don't know, but we are so blessed to be living in an era that we could watch her just absolutely cook on the field. Her speed is so amazing. And the way that Kansas City uses her is so amazing. And it has really played to their advantage. Well, I feel like all Casey needs to do is win a championship this year. And in Temwa's first year in the league, she <laughs> will have done. I mean, maybe other than winning MVP and finals MVP at this point, every year here on out is just like just trying to better herself and break her own record. It's like you already yeah. put yourself in a completely different league. <laughs> like in the next five years, like what is, maybe she'll go in net, honestly. <laughs> you try to get a <laughs> shutout season. Like she's, in my eyes, she's superwoman. Well, let's stay with Kansas City because the current tied the record for most goals scored in a single season at 54. With one game left in the season, they are likely to break it. And the current did this in just their fourth year in the league. So are they like, are they the future of NWSL? They have a lot going on for them. I mean, CBK Stadium is the first stadium built specifically for a professional women's team. They're definitely setting the bar when it comes to women's sports. I think they're up there with the future. I mean, we do have to look back at the results that they've had. I think the first year they didn't do very well. And then the second they were runners up mm -hmm. and then they went back to not doing well. And now they're kind of top mid this year. I think they're three right now. Um, I'm interested to see how they do in the playoffs, but I think given that they have their own stadium and the fans are insane, I think it was a 13th sold out match in a row that they just had this weekend. So obviously the market is there. They love it. We have great ownership and coaching behind it. So I'm really interested to see what they're going to do. And I think whatever it is, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And they're in such a, like you said, such a special market that like KC fans just love their sports <laughs> no matter what. And if you want, bring Taylor Swift into the conversation. I know we're both not Swifties, but let's say she's like, hey guys, go to a game. Like the impact that that will have is massive. And the people already doing that, their impact has been massive. So their future is very, very bright to say the least. I agree. Um, well, actually, let's look on the international stage. Last weekend, Emma Hayes announced her 26 player training camp roster for the current FIFA international window. And the roster includes 18 members of the Olympic roster and six uncapped players, three of them making their first U.S. Women's National Team camp. You can tell based on the roster that this camp is a time for Emma to experiment with you. I'm sorry, new and young talent. Um, Logan, were there any names that surprised you? Um, Eva Gatino, I mm -hmm. believe her is how you say her name. She plays in PSG, but that in my mind is telling me that Emma, we knew she was already looking at the international market or playing overseas, but she's looking there even more because she's kind of come up here and there, but hasn't really been as big of a name as let's say Corbin Albert playing with PSG. So I'm excited to see her. And also Alyssa Melanson. I'm not gonna lie. I had to Google her name and even watching as much soccer that I have for some reason, I haven't heard it before, but she was the first expansion pick for Bay and she was doing really well at Auburn. So she's playing in the NWSL. I haven't really heard her name, but Emma clearly has. So you could tell that she's been looking at everybody and there's a trend that these are really young players. So I'm excited to hear those, but also when Olympic players don't have to be on the roster, 
I don't know what that roster is going to be like, but it's mm -hmm. going to be, I feel like an amalgamation of just different players from different leagues, from different ages, different school, like everything. What word did you just use? Amalgamation. <laughs> my mom used it growing up and it's stuck in my head. <laughs> what does that mean? Is it kind of like a smorgasbord? A belting pot? Okay, a smorgasbord. A Amalgamation? A <laughs> Wait, now I'm questioning my English. No, 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 I no. I just English. like, I learned something new today. So that's like my <laughs> key takeaway from this episode. Amalgamation? Yeah, I believe it's another word for combination. Okay, we're going with it. Well, thank you for teaching me something new today. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Well, let's close out uh, the show. And as you all know, the foundation of Good Follow is that communities get built one Good Follow at a time. And each week, one of us will highlight a person, page, or brand as the Good Follow of the week. So, Logan, you're up this week. Who is your Good Follow? Alrighty, my Good Follow of the week is Shannon Domingsel, I believe is how you say it, at Shannon Domingsel on TikTok. She does social for the NFL and vlogs her days. So, if you've ever seen a viral NFL moment on TikTok. She is most likely the one behind it. Let's take a look at one of her behind the scenes videos. Come work football Sunday with me at the NFL. So because I work for the league, we have to do every single game on a Sunday. So I'm not working for a particular team where I get to focus just on one game. It is every single game. There's too many things. Oh! Wait, that would have been so bad. <laughs> Ten fifteen. I think we're done. Absolutely insane. I mean, I can barely keep up with Red Zone on NFL Sundays. It is <laughs> way too much to me. I prefer to just watch one game, but. She has to keep up with every single one and post about it. I just think that's honestly like having a superpower, but also as somebody who loves the NFL, I love to see women take up space in men's sports and be very, very good at it. So cool to see her running things and she's funny with it. There was a moment when she was like, here, damn, when a lot of people were asking for a certain video, I think. And I think that reply went more viral than the video in question. So that is my good follow of the week. Everyone go follow at Shannon Domingsel on TikTok. I love her. I follow her. Um, yeah, I just also to your point, like to to do all of that on a day to day basis for your full time job and then bring us behind the scenes with a vlog is so much work. And the fact that she does it consistently. And also, I love her because she's another Filipino in sports and can sing her butt off. So definitely follow her on TikTok because you're going to get a what's the word? amalgamation an amalgamation of content <laughs> i was actually gonna ask if, if you knew if she was filipino or not i follow her she goes by like shani right yeah she yeah. will give you an amalgamation of content so <laughs> i love the good follow and we want to hear from you our fans who is your good follow send your nominations to at good follow show and tell us why your good follow should be featured on our show Good Follow is brought to you by DraftKings. We will see you next week.